Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 180. This is the first official Dry Dock of 2022 and at least at the time of recording I am happy to report that I am neither on fire, flooded, drowned or under attack by zombies. So I guess we can get on with answering questions. This week they're from the video on shore bombardment in World War 2 and from guide 2 Three one two hundred thirty one on the S ninety class of torpedo boats of the Imperial German Navy. Drei Sparen asks, why did the Russians lose so few ships during Operation Albion, considering that the Germans came in with ten battleships and a battle cruiser? Well, a good chunk of it is simply the fact the Russians didn't have that many forces in the area to lose. The Russians kind of see the writing on the wall with Operation Albion. They weren't going to commit the entire Baltic fleet, uh, which for the most part stayed closer to its home bases. And the ships they did commit mounted to a couple of pre-dreadnoughts, a couple of larger cruisers, small cruiser, and then everything else was destroyers and such like. So, you know, there wasn't a large battle fleet present to challenge the Germans, so the ma the maximum number of large capital units the Germans could have destroyed was quite limited anyway. And even from that, again, because the Russians knew that there was no way they were going to be challenging the entire German fleet that was present, they were very picky and choosy about where they engaged. They were quite careful to preserve the strength that they had as much as possible. And as a result, they only really engaged from either when they absolutely had to or from positions of relative strength. And so they only ended up losing uh, one battleship Slava and uh, one destroyer, plus a couple of sm small craft that got destroyed and one British submarine that was there for the ride, I guess. And if you're wondering why the Baltic fleet didn't go after them, well, at absolute best the baltic fleet had four dreadnoughts plus a number of pre-dreadnoughts so there was no way they were going to beat the german fleet in a straight-up gun battle and compared to the loss of you know most if not all of the baltic fleet losing the islands that had been targeted in operation albion just wasn't worth it it was much better if they were going to have to end up losing the Baltic fleet. It would be much better to lose the Baltic fleet in a battle to defend St. Petersburg with, you know, the guns of the various fortresses there helping to support the Russian ships to do the maximum possible damage to the German ships. Joe Brown asks, You mentioned that the recovery of S-119's codebook in 1914 enabled the British to read German codes for the rest of the war. Did the Germans not change their codes? It seems like this would have been good practice given the number of ships they lost to enemy action and the likelihood that somewhere along the line an opponent might recover one of the books. In World War One and in World War Two, to be honest, the Germans sh exhibited a few missteps that really didn't help their efforts, one of which was a significant overconfidence in the security of their codes, whether that be code books in World War One or Enigma and, World, and other systems in World War Two, it simply doesn't seem to have occurred to that many German officers involved in signals intelligence work that their codes might be compromised, or that their codes even could be compromised. And the one or two who thought it might be were generally hushed up or shouted down by everybody else who was convinced that everything was absolutely secure. Now, in World War I, there is also a... When it comes to codebooks, there is also a practical issue, because it's, well, the Germans aren't losing warships every day, but over the course of the war, they are losing warships on a semi-regular basis of some description or another. And for the vast majority of cases well either they don't know because the ships have gone down with all hands or all survivors have been picked up by the British but in cases where there are survivors that they're able to debrief everyone's saying yes we followed the procedures to destroy the secret code books or something to that effect or maybe like the chart house was set on fire there's no way they could have survived so they're thinking okay well the British don't have their hands on these code books and so why should we change them? Because you've got to remember, if you're going to change 
something as substantial as the code books they're coming up with, not only has someone got to sit down and develop a brand new code book with the same level of sort of cryptographic integrity as the previous one or better, you've then got to agree to it, have that agreed, then printed in large enough numbers and then securely distributed across the entire fleet with an instruction date of, you know, this is when you start using this one which is a major logistical effort. If you did that every time Germany lost a ship in circumstances where the British might have some way of accessing the wreck at some point, and bearing in mind that the capture of the Cobra and S-119 wasn't a result of accessing the wreck, it was a kind of a lucky snag by a trawler, you end up effectively replacing the code books so often you might as well just come up with one-time code sheets and distribute them to a squadron or a fleet every time they went out on an operation which would be much less well a one-time code sheet might be very secure from one perspective but it would be much less secure from another perspective in as much as it's going to be far 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 simpler because you know again you think of the size of these code books you're not going to develop all of that for a one-off operation every single time and finally, you've also got to take into account of whether the Germans think their codes are compromised. If they actually, as a collective Intel organization, do believe their codes are compromised, then of course they will change their code books. And this did happen with some of the code books, because remember, different aspects of German naval high command had different code books, and a few of those did get changed at points during the war when they thought they might be compromised. But you've got to have some proof, again, because of the effort involved, you've got to have some proof that this is a necessary thing to do. And that's actually very difficult to come across from the German side of World War I because the British are playing things incredibly close to their chest with their intelligence, as was outlined in the Room 40 video. Now, you could actually very well argue that and I would agree that perhaps they played things a bit too close to their chest in the name of operational security, and as a result, not enough of the decoded information was sent out to points where it could actually do operational good. But at the same time, that kind of security paranoia meant that it would have, it was very unlikely for anybody to develop a suspicion that the codebooks had been compromised, and even if they did, it was incredibly difficult to provide any hard proof that they'd been compromised. Pretty much anything you could point to during the war from a German perspective that would say, maybe our codes have been compromised, also had a significant alternative theory, mostly in the form of land-based radio direction finding. And it was thus easier to assume that that was the case, because if all the instances that you can point to and say look they might have compromised our codes can be explained by yes or they could have done that by radio direction finding and then all the instances where perhaps you wouldn't be able to compromise German operational security by radio direction finding you'd have to have access to the code book to do so and the British don't appear to have exploited that particular transmission well then, sort of a pattern matching would seem to suggest that maybe it's the radio direction finding and not just the code books. That, uh, well, and not the code book that's the problem, because surely if something of whatever operation, let's say a, a sally of U-boats or something, if it was that important, which we know the British are trying to stop the U-boats, but they don't appear to have done anything about this, and the only way they could have known is if they cracked the code book, well then surely they haven't cracked the code book. Um, so... It's as much a piece of psychological warfare as it is actual crypt cryptographic warfare. Steve Valley asks, Were small German maritime turbines of this era particularly fragile or maintenance intensive? And the Ottoman Empire had some Shihau built torpedo boats, and the two that survived World War One were immediately scrapped, whilst French built boats with vertical triple expansion engines that were slightly older served until the early 1930s. Greece brought two turbine powered V90 class torpedo boats in 1912, which were also scrapped immediately after the war, um, though I've been informed that the French signed crews that tent tended to neglect and loot those ships. The Vulcan built boats that Greece ordered immediately after the V90s were triple expansion engine powered and served into 1941, in spite of also being in the care of the French for part of World War I. The Greek cruiser 
Ellie with, uh, or Eli possibly, with Parsons turbines also survived French possession and served until being sunk by the Itali an Italian sub in 1940. It seems that only the torpedo boats with Shihau or AEG Vulcan turbines had the lifespan of a Mayfly. I think it's more a case of the circumstances post-World War One. Everyone was downscaling their navies. The Ottoman navy, obviously, in the process of collapse, reforming as the Turkish navy, really had to downsize their navies. Um, but everybody was facing a degree of sort of downsizing, which meant you had to make decisions as to what ships you were going to get rid of and what ships you were going to keep. Now, within the context of that, you have to look at, for the, for the Turks particularly, the Shihau built torpedo boats, dash destroyers, were much larger than anything else that they had in that uh, sort of weight category. So they were pretty expensive to run. So if you're trying to save money, getting rid of the couple of big expensive ships in order to keep a couple of smaller, less expensive ships makes sense. Additionally, when you have a, sort of some vertical triple expansion engine ships and some steam turbine ships whilst the steam turbine ships make a lot vast 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 more amount of sense for big navies they are still somewhat more advanced technologically speaking and a bit more specialist to keep running than vertical triple expansion engines which have been around for a lot longer and there's a lot wider base of knowledge on how to maintain them so if you are someone like the Greek or the Turkish Navy, a small number of ships, very limited budget, it makes more sense to keep ships that have an easier maintenance path than ships that are more difficult, more expensive to keep going, especially given that, you know, either the Navy is going to be looking at the situation and going, well, none of our ships are actually modern. We're not realistically going to put up a fight against anyone other than well, in Turkey and Greece's cases, perhaps each other. Um, so we don't need to keep the latest and greatest in our fleet if that's going to be ruinously expensive when we can get by with something smaller, cheaper and easier to keep going. And the final factor is that, you know, it's immediately post-World War I. Germany has rather decisively lost. There's... A fair amount of stuff on the market at this point but more importantly the German shipyards are not really in much of a position to be providing spare parts whereas the French and British shipyards most definitely are. Uh, German shipyards in the aftermath of World War One faced huge huge problems. Shihau in particular almost went under in the early 1920s it was only kept afloat by direct german government intervention and obviously there wasn't a lot of that to go around so they were quite fortunate so it, this is another sort of comparison issue if you're looking at well we've got a ship powered by parsons turbines or french vertical triple expansion engines well as those navies are decommissioning large numbers of similarly engined craft there'll be a lot of cheap spares on the market that you can stock up on and those manufacturers being the manufacturers of the winning side of the war are going to be in business for quite a while so that guarantees a long-term supply chain as well whereas you look over the other side and you know there's treaty limits on what the germans can do with their shipyards their shipyards themselves are in rather significant amounts of economic trouble and you know helpfully they've scuttled a bunch of their ships so you're not going to get any reusable spare parts out of them so your long-term maintenance path looks uncertain to say the least if you're having to think about getting parts from somewhere like Shihau in the early 20s so I think it's a combination of all of those factors which result in a lot of uh, these smaller navies dropping German powered or German engined and derived ships in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Contact Alias asks, I've noticed in a lot of depictions of Age of Sail ships and those preceding the Age of Sail, the hulls appear to be very curved, and in many depictions the gun ports seem to follow the curvature of the decks. However, in some of those images, the curvature of the decks is so severe that the bow and stern portions of a deck might actually be higher than the midship section of the deck just above it. 
It would appear that later in the Age of Sail, ships' hulls lost their curvature and the decks appear to be leveled from bow to stern. How much of the curvature of ships' decks is due to artistic license? It varies, of course, from ship to ship, but the curvature in the deck from the curvature in the overall ship's hull is very much a real thing in old Age of Sail ships. Uh, here's a picture, of course, of Avasa from my visit to the Vasa Museum. And, well, you can see from this, hopefully, you know, there is quite a curvature in her gun ports and quite a curvature thus in the decks underneath them. And when you're looking at the ship from the other end and you're looking at the main deck, the quarter deck, etc., etc., you can see there is quite the slope to some of those decks fore and aft. And in large part, that's because of how the ships were built, how they were framed, where the major structural timbers were, and thus where the decks needed to follow. Um, in sort of, if you like, if you divide, I suppose if you divide the Age of Sail into roughly three periods, so uh, the medieval period up to the start of gun-armed ships, then the early gun-armed ships, and then maybe the what you might call the classic Age of Sail from the early to mid 1700s um, onwards. Then the in those first two periods you know the where the deck went and how it sloped was much more at the mercy of how the hull was shaped than it would be in later periods in part because ships just got larger and in part because design techniques evolved somewhat but particularly with gun armed vessels from an engineering standpoint there is actually a certain degree of logic to what you see going on on ships like Vasa and that is the a ship is going to pitch, that is the movement um, backwards and for the forwards, either bow rising or falling, the or the stern rising or falling, as opposed to roll, around, roughly speaking, its centre of gravity, unless there's a massive wave that's altering that. And the centre of gravity is going to be usually somewhere amidships, unless you've done something horribly wrong with your balancing and trim. And so if you're gun ports are all straight and level and as low as you can get them because obviously you don't want to compromise the stability of the ship too much then you're going to face a problem because if you have the gun ports at a certain height above the sea whenever the ship pitches back and forth the forward and aft gun ports are going to become dangerously close to the water level if not underwater completely which means that you'll sink so you have to raise the level of your gun ports and thus the level of your deck and thus the ship becomes less stable you can carry fewer guns or lighter guns not lots of heavy guns whereas if you have a deck that follows the line of your hull and curves up at either end then as the ship pitches down or pitches up depending on obviously where it's going then your gun ports which perhaps at the bow have started off two or three foot higher on the same deck level as the ones amidships okay they're going to go down but they're not necessarily going to submerge so they'll stay above water so it's a, actually a rather smart design compromise in some ways to allow you to have the maximum number of heavy guns as low as possible in the ship without either limiting the number of guns or making you founder once you get larger ships and you can just well a a larger ship doesn't usually pitch as much um, or at least it pitches less for the same level of sea conditions um, the sea will always make a ship pitch no matter how big you make it um, but in the lower sea conditions the ones where you might actually be fighting they'll pitch a bit a little bit less so you don't need to take that into account quite as much and also just by being larger ships you can afford to have the guns slightly higher up anyway to keep them a bit drier lloyd knighton asks we both know that USS Constitution didn't really have sides made of iron, where an 18-pound cannonball fired by Guria is alleged to have glanced off her live oak hull, but do you know of any instance where cannonballs did bounce off of a hull of a wooden ship? And if so, was this a common occurrence? So this is kind of a sliding scale question. Cannonballs could and did bounce off of the hulls of warships. It just wasn't very common. So you've got to take into account a few factors. 
weight of the shot, range of the shot, and angle of the shot. So, you know, when Guria, if she's driving a broadside straight into Constitution, you know, at, with her guns at 90 degrees to Constitution's hull, at close range, an 18-pound ball is going to go straight through. And, you know, you can tell that Constitution did get shot up to varying degrees in her engagements with various British frigates, apart from anything else, by her actions and by the repair bill when she got back into port. You know, you don't get a repair bill for patching up the hull if people haven't shot holes in it. Um, And a lot of the time when a British ship surrendered to her, the first thing she'd do rather than go in and take possession was stand off a little way and conduct repairs of her own, then come in and take possession. So, you know, the ships weren't immune to gunfire. However, if the shot is coming in at an angle, then it might bounce or ricochet, depending on the toughness of the material that the hull's made of. At close range, it's fairly less likely. But if it's from, say, something like a carronade, which is a lower velocity weapon, then it's perhaps more likely than it would be coming out from a long gun. If the ship is further away, the velocity will drop off, and thus when it hits the hull, whether it hits more directly or more likely at something of an angle, it's more likely to again bounce or ricochet, and exponentially more so if it's from a carronade who's starting out with a low velocity in the first place. And then of course you have the weight of shot, so you know, a 24 pounder ball or a 32 pounder ball is much carrying a lot more energy than an 18 pounder or a 12 pounder or a 9 pounder ball so a lighter shot is more likely to bounce now shots did stick in hulls quite a bit um, lots of long range or lower powered shots etc uh, and shot might be dug out of the the wood it might be kind of embedded in the hull um, quite away because remember you're talking about several feet of thickness of timber in some places um, or they might just be you know sticking up like a giant rivet head or something in between and in line battles yeah that could happen the thing when it came to something like constitution was that you know she was built out of a pretty strong material in the first place a bit stronger than average um, she was very heavily framed frame not and again not like a ship of the line but much closer to a ship of the line than a frigate um, and she was facing ships that were armed with a mixture of cannons and carronades and they were fighting at a variety of ranges and a variety of angles so there would be instances where it's entirely plausible both for constitution and other american super frigates and for a large variety of other ships at sea, like ships of the line in general, that say a shot from a medium or low weight gun, something like an 18 pound or a 9 pound or something, coming in from range and striking at an angle might very well bounce off a ship. And these things did, did happen um, on a semi regular basis. It's just that, to be honest, unless you got a pretty good strike or, or hit with a very heavy gun, no one was really expecting much else. And then as the range closes and the angles get better, things start to get a lot more messy. But what's notable about it happening, apart from obviously a, a certain degree of propagandizing, but with the War of 1812, is that because the Constitution and her sisters were built a little bit stronger than the average frigate, you would get these kinds of ricochets that might be more commonly associated with a ship of the line a bit more often in what was otherwise a frigate-on-frigate frigate engagement, and that would make it somewhat notable um, as compared to a standard frigate versus frigate fight. Volrosk U asks... Were there any ships outside of monitors explicitly designed as bombardment ships? For example, a bombardment cruiser with a higher than average main and secondary battery at the cost of higher end range finding and anti-aircraft batteries. Not to the same degree that monitors were designed. The Edgar class cruisers had some of their members redeveloped and reworked during World War I to take up shore bombardment roles. But 
they were originally designed as fairly standard ocean-going cruisers. They weren't designed from scratch as bombardment vessels. About the closest you're probably likely to come to a ship that's largely designed for bombardment work above anything else would be something like the Flores-class gunboats of the Dutch Navy. Now, normally a gunboat would have a three or four inch battery and would be designed for mostly colonial work and a little bit of ocean-going escort work, whereas the Flores-class, as you can see here, were armed with a few cruiser-grade guns rather than destroyer-grade guns. And they were also equipped with a, a series of systems, including fire control systems and a fair degree of elevation on the guns that actually did make them quite suitable for shore bombardment, a role which they took to with great alacrity in the Second World War. So uh, something like that, I say, would, I would say is, is the closest example of a, well, it's not a bombardment cruiser, it's a bombardment gunboat at that point, but gunboats in general general are probably about the closest you're going to get to ships that have a significant portion of their design uh, made for shore bombardment rather than oceanic combat. Once you go much above that kind of size into, you know, full-on cruiser size, the expense becomes such that people ask, well, why don't you just do a normal cruiser? Because an, a normal cruiser can probably do a good enough job of shore bombardment if it has to, whereas a explicitly shore bombardment designed cruiser will cost a fortune and can only do that role. It's not going to do very well in the open ocean if you've made sacrifices of, you know, like a monitor of lower speed, more gunpower, but can't necessarily shoot as far. PS147 asks. Even though the preliminary attacks on the Normandy beaches were massive, why did they do so little damage to the Atlantic Wall? It depends how you define so little damage. There were quite a number of Atlantic Wall installations that were destroyed or disrupted by the shore bombardments. But, admittedly, the whole thing wasn't suppressed. But one of the things you've got to remember is that it's not... Well, one, it's actually very difficult to take out individual pillboxes and bunkers the way that the Atlant like the Atlantic Wall was mostly set up. And two, outright destruction by the shore bombardment wasn't necessarily the primary objective. It would have been nice if it happened. But the, one of the big purposes of the shore bombardment by the heavier capital ships, when they weren't shooting at troop concentrations or in the field German artillery and things like that, when, I, when they were actually shooting at the German fixed defences, was to occupy them. Because if you've got a battleship shooting at you, you generally tend to shoot back. And if you're, from the Allied perspective, if the shore batteries are shooting back at, their, at the heavily armoured Allied battleships, then they're not shooting at the much closer and much more vulnerable Allied landing craft. So even if... You know, a bunch of shore batteries have a running gun engagement with something like USS Texas or HMS Warspite. And even if neither side hits the other all day, that's a win for the Allies. Because, you know, OK, I haven't hit you, you haven't hit me. But in the meantime, I've managed to put several hundred thousand men on your beaches. And they'll come on along with flamethrowers and grenades and tomorrow you won't be operational. So I guess I win anyway. Um so there's that element, but as I also mentioned, there is this other problem of actually hitting the things in the first place. You know, the a battleship, a cruiser, something, or even a destroyer that you might be targeting in an ocean is several hundred feet long. You know, even destroyers are reasonably large vessels, and a bunker is not. It might be a few dozen feet if that wide and that means it's just exponentially harder to hit and if the bunkers dug in with lots of earthworks and such then well you know you're gonna probably have to use some armor piercing shells although you might use a lot of ap to be perfectly fair but whatever you're using you know if you get a salvo that is say 
it's a let's say it lands in a position such that if you'd been shooting a battleship sized target you'd get three hits out of eight guns fired that would be a very accurate salvo in a fight at sea at any significant range but you know if you're targeting a ship that's six seven hundred feet long let's say those three shell hits are spaced out relatively evenly so each shell hit might be a couple of hundred feet away from the next one well there's a gap between each shell hit where you could hide two or three bunkers and a shell landing 50 foot away from a big concrete bunker okay it's going to rattle people inside a little bit but it's not going to knock that bunker out even though that salvo would be classed as very accurate at sea so this kind of explains why not quite as many bunkers were hit as you might think compared to the number of shells that were thrown at them from the battleships and this is actually an evolution of shore defense this is one of the many changes you get during the interwar period and leading up to world war ii because when you look at the coastal fortifications uh, pre-world war one and even going into world war one quite a lot of them are based on fortress systems so the installation is much larger and you'll have batteries of guns or in the earlier periods before they realized how useless they were mortars um, all in one place and one of the things people came to realize relatively quickly was that even if you had disappearing gun mounts or hidden hidden um, batteries or whatever sheer statistics worked against you if you were being bombarded by a large naval force if your fortress was pretty darn big it was going to be difficult to miss and if you had multiple guns all clustered in roughly the same area then you know a shell that came in within say 150 foot of its aim point assuming that it had been aimed properly would hit something important Whereas if you split all these guns up into small individual bunkers and batteries, yes, it might be more expensive overall to build each one of these singly as opposed to one larger fortress. But A, you weren't likely to lose multiple guns to one hit, and B, they were much harder to hit in the first place. The downside, of course, being that with everything separated, you couldn't coordinate salvo fire anywhere near as effectively, which meant your overall accuracy would suffer compared to if you had the same fire control equipment linking to multiple guns all in roughly the same vicinity. And even if you did score a hit, you'd only score a hit with one gun rather than a, a full salvo. So there were trade-offs involved. MA asks, why did the US never use 18-inch guns? Basically, timing. The US did consider the use of 18-inch guns. They were developing 18-inch guns in the early 1920s. Possibly the successor to the South Dakota class 1920 design might have used them. And they were looking at them again towards the end of the 1930s. But in the first case, the Washington Naval Treaty came in and said, no, you're not having anything bigger than 16-inch guns. And in the latter case, there was quite a bit of discussion to a certain extent when the Iowa was being constructed and even more so when the Montana was as to whether to use a 16 inch 50 gun a new 16 inch 56 caliber gun or an 18 inch weapon but the concerns that were voiced were basically well essentially whether or not it would offer all that much more compared to a 16 inch gun given what they knew of enemy warships at the time in terms of their protection etc versus the firepower that you'd get at them because thanks to the square cube law an 18 inch gun is a very heavy weapon compared to a 16 inch gun and that meant that if you were looking at something like say an iowa you got nine 16 inch guns this is good if you want to build a ship of approximately similar size and specification to an iowa but with 18 inch guns you drop from triples to twins which means you only have six guns and that is bordering on unacceptable for the u.s navy even for a montana you'd be down to eight guns which you know eight guns compared to 12 that's four extra shells coming in and 
given that the US really liked the idea of long range deck penetrations at the time, a high power 18 inch gun actually technically worked against their ideas because an, a good 18 inch gun at ranges where they're thinking that a 16 inch gun with a super heavy shell can drop shells into an enemy's deck, well at that range the 18 inch projectile is still going to be on a relatively shallow, relatively speaking, um, angle which means it's still going to be hitting the belt armour and when you factor in the fact that you know, you're not going to have as many guns firing and they're going to be slightly slower firing because the guns themselves are going to be slower to aim the shells and the charges are going to be heavier and harder to load etc they, they basically came to a conclusion that actually we'd prefer to have more 16 inch guns than fewer 18 inch guns would they have changed their tune if they'd known about Yamato's true specs earlier? Quite possibly. But effectively, those were the only two periods in the early 20s and the late 30s where they had the opportunity, and in both cases, they were blocked by various reasons. Lucarian Ape asks, Relating to Hood and her final action, some sources I've seen claim that when she was critically hit and sinking, Hood launched a torpedo at Bismarck, which forced it to turn away from Prince of Wales. A bit more clarity would be appreciated on this. So, first thing, um, Hood, if she launched torpedoes, which I think there's a reasonable chance that she did, didn't launch them when she was in the middle of sinking. Uh, for one thing, the area where the torpedo launchers were, which you can see in this photo, had kind of disintegrated at that point, so that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, but... If she launched torpedoes, it would have happened earlier. Now, she could do this because her torpedoes, as with many other torpedoes in World War II, had gyro settings that allowed you to launch them out off the side of a ship and get them to do a turn. So the fact that she wasn't broadside to Bismarck, or actually, if you're thinking about torpedo launches, perhaps her, her broadside wasn't pointing ahead of where Bismarck was, isn't actually a strike against her being able to launch torpedoes and have them head in the right direction. Now, the other the, the reason why this comes up is because, yes, Bismarck and Prince Eugen did turn away from what was left of Hood and Prince of Wales because they heard torpedoes in the water. <clears throat> More specifically, Prince Eugen heard torpedoes in the water on her hydrophones. And she reported that, and Bismarck and Prince Eugen went, well, we don't want to get hit by torpedoes, so, you know, best thing to do, comb tracks, get out of the way, which is what they did. If the timings that are reported by Prince Eugen are accurate, and there's not particularly any reason to doubt that they were, so at the, t at the time that she thought she heard torpedoes and at the range that she thought they were at, if you look at the type of torpedo that Hood had on board and you backtrack at the speed that the torpedo would have been going... The, that further confirms, you know, the launch would have happened a few, at least a few minutes, if not possibly a little bit earlier than when Hood was actually hit. Now, the detail of that is that Prince Eugen had some pretty good hydrophones, and she'd actually used those hydrophones earlier. She'd heard Prince of Wales and Hood coming onto the scene before they actually appeared on the horizon. This is how good both Prince Eugen's hydrophone sensitivity was and how good her operators were that they were able to classify that there were two British capital ships coming. And then, I'd say, in the aftermath of uh, what was happening with, with Hood, they hear noises in the water, they listen to them, they conclude this is torpedoes coming in. Um, and that's where the report comes from. The flip side to that is that none of Hood's three survivors report hearing an order to launch torpedoes. But then again, of the three survivors, only Ted Briggs was on the bridge, so realistically only he would probably be the one to be able to confirm or deny whether torpedoes were launched. And that, that in and of itself assumes that, A, if a torpedo launch order was given from the bridge that he remembered that it was, and B, that the bridge actually ordered the torpedoes to be launched. It's entirely possible for whatever reason, that um, the torpedo crews themselves launched those torpedoes. Now, as I've outlined before, I don't personally 
by the idea that the torpedoes exploded or that the torpedoes were hit or that they had anything to do with Hood's destruction. But as you can possibly appreciate from this photo, Hood did have a fire on her boat deck. And as you can see, that is in a relative degree of proximity to the torpedoes. So it's possible that perhaps the torpedo launcher crews, knowing that perhaps there's a fire immediately above them, might have decided for safety's sake we need to get rid of these torpedoes and you know yes we might be out of range but if we're gonna dump these torpedoes over the side and anyway we might as well send them vaguely in the enemy's direction because they might have some kind of disruptive effect which if they did that actually did happen so of course without direct confirmation from the survivors of hood's crew and without anyone actually you know finding a british torpedo sitting at the bottom sort of several T ten, probably tens of miles once you've taken account of the thing sinking and drifting etc away from Hood's wreck we're never going to know 100% but there's a number of plausible scenarios wherein Hood might have launched a couple of torpedoes and you know at the end of the day given the prior performance of Prince Eugen's hydrophone crew I don't have any particular reason to doubt them when they say they heard torpedoes in the water. So whether those torpedoes were going to run out of range, they almost certainly would have done, and they would run out of range and not necessarily hit unless they were coasting um, by the time they may or may not have reached the positions where Bismarck and Bristol were, because remember the hydrophones heard them when they were a distance off, is another matter entirely. But given what evidence we do have, I can't see any particularly strong reason to turn around and suddenly randomly accuse Prince Eugen's hydrophone crew of having developed a massive case of nerves or incompetence. Richard Scrabble asks, why did the Alaska class have amidships aviation facilities when every other post-treaty cruiser battleship had stern aviation facilities? Well, for one thing, Alaska is derived from cruiser designs, not battleship designs, so she's going to follow more cruiser-like design tendencies secondly within that the clevelands baltimores and wichita all have stern aviation facilities in much the same way that the battleships do however uh, with the exception of wichita everything else i just mentioned in terms of cruiser design is absolute end of the 1930s cruiser design and they're built in the 1940s when you look at the design history of the Alaska class, the original designs of a 12-inch supercruiser that will eventually become the Alaskas actually are drafted in 1937 in sketch form and in more detail in 1938. And at that point in history, when you look at things like the New Orleans class and the Brooklyns, their aviation facilities are amidships and since alaska is a large cruiser or supercruiser her aviation facilities are also amidships and it appears that whilst the design development went on and then the alaskas were ordered this requirement just stayed there it was never particularly changed and as a result when you get to them being launched you have this like odd thing of in the intervening period the Clevelands and the Baltimores have been launched. The new battleships have been launched. They've all got stern aviation facilities. And the Alaskas just have a hangar and catapults amidships, which in part contributes to the fact that they, despite their much greater size, they only have slightly greater anti-aircraft firepower than the Baltimores do. And in actual fact, um, the only increase in size of AA guns that they have is in the light and medium 20 and 40 millimeter categories. They have the same number of 5 inch 38s. The reason it looks so incongruous is because of their long build times, partly because of their size and partly because, as I mentioned in other videos, they were delayed in favor of other projects. And so they appear much later than perhaps they would have if they'd been built to, with the same level of urgency as everything else. Joseph Nielsen asks, how key was the San Nazaire dry dock to the Germans? Separately, he also asks, I'd like to know what you think about reusing the name Utah for another US Navy vessel. Does that diminish or enhance the status and honour of the battleship in Pearl Harbour? Uh, 
The San Nazaire dock was a very key installation for the Germans when it came to the Atlantic and surface commerce raiding. There were other docks available on the west coast of France that could accommodate something the size of a Scharnhorst, as had been proven earlier. But if you wanted to have Bismarck or Tirpitz out there, and obviously by this point Bismarck had already been sunk, although she'd been heading for this dock for repairs, this was the only dock that could accommodate a ship that size. Now, this is all part of the, you know, the problems the French were having with infrastructure prior to the war, because for their Richelieu-class battleships, they near enough would have been in the same boat for various reasons. But having had you know Bismarck go out and all the shenanigans that happened with her voyage, the Royal Navy and the British government as a whole didn't really want Tirpitz to go out and repeat the process. And they reasoned that, well, if we knock out the saint Nazaire dock, then there's nowhere in France for a damaged Tirpitz to go. So if she sails out into the Atlantic and is damaged, then she only has one of two options, either go to the west coast of France anyway and sit around uselessly damaged for a very long period of time, or try and limp her way back up the English Channel in a damaged condition, in which case, after the debacle of the Channel Dash, hopefully the defences have improved somewhat and she'll be able to be sunk there. So it was pretty important to getting rid of the threat of a large German battleship breaking out into the Atlantic. And, I mean, to a certain degree, it's responsible for Tirpitz being stuck up in Norway. Not entirely, because, of course, Tirpitz could have remained in Germany or gone on to operations in the Baltic, which she did for a little bit. But there weren't that many things for a Bismarck-class battleship to do on the North German coast or in the Baltic that couldn't be done by other smaller vessels. The only places that Tirpitz had any real role by the mid-portion of the war was either going out and raiding the Atlantic or threatening the Arctic convoys. And with the San Nazaire raid knocking out any ability for her to reasonably safely go out into the Atlantic, it constrained her effectively to, well, I guess you're just watching the Arctic convoys for a long time. Um, now, as regards Utah, personally, I think, yeah, you... You probably can reuse the name. My general feeling is that if a ship has gone down in battle, then, or has just sunk generally, you, you should be fairly at liberty to name a new ship after it. I mean, the previous HMS Victory to the one that's currently in Portsmouth sank at sea in a storm. Obviously, they reused the name. Um, now, I'll grant you that some ships that have gone down in a very spectacular action and have had a very deep psychological impact on their home nation those names probably shouldn't be reused at least for as long as that impact lasts so you know USS Arizona perfectly understandable why they are keeping her in commission technically even though obviously she's not going anywhere um and HMS Hood, you know, you're probably not going to see another HMS Hood in the Royal Navy for a good time to come. But for something like Utah, her sinking in and of itself, it doesn't represent the massive loss of life that Arizona's did. It doesn't have as much of a psychological impact as Arizona's did. Yes, her wreck is still there, and yes, it's still visible. But there are other wrecks of other ships that are around and still visible and their names have been reused. So I don't think it would particularly affect the status or honour of the current wreck of Utah if her name was reused. If anything, I think it would actually be somewhat better because then you could add something to the memorial saying you know, this ship was named in honour of this battleship and now continues to serve in the US Navy. Vinve asks, During the Age of Sail, Royal Navy officers on half pay would sign up as mercenaries in foreign navies, with Thomas Cochrane being probably the most famous example. When did this practice end? Were there Royal Navy officers freelancing in smaller foreign navies in the Age of Steam and Steel? Were there British generals commanding in some corner of the world right after World War II? 
So, yes, there were Royal Navy officers quite happily freelancing around in smaller foreign navies in the age of steam and steel, um, certainly in the late 19th century. This all came about in large part due to the system of half pay. So the Royal Navy found itself in the late 17th and then obviously in the 18th and early 19th centuries in a state where it would be at war. It would be at war for quite a while. So the Navy would have to expand. There'd have to be a lot of officers, a lot of ships, etc. And then it would no longer be at war for a little bit. But then a few years down the line, it would be back at war and the Navy would have to build itself back up again from the peacetime reductions. This obviously would be quite difficult in terms of skilled manpower. And one of the systems that was come up with was the idea of half pay. So admirals, officers, other skilled, certain other skilled men could be put ashore on half pay during times of peace and the idea was, as the name suggests, they would only be paid a portion of their normal salary, so they saved money, but in return, they were still obligated to be recalled back to the Navy whenever the Navy needed them, which meant that if the Navy found itself back at war again, they could just go, OK, everyone on half pay, you're back at full pay, report back to your sh to various ports to be assigned to ships ASAP. And suddenly you have an experienced officer corps and certain other key skills and trades ready to go, which was actually quite an efficient way of doing things. However, of course, being on half your salary <laughs> um, didn't necessarily always pay the bills. And sometimes years of peace could stretch into a decade or two of peace and officers who liked fighting and also liked earning a fair bit of money could get bored and because they were technically unemployed and effectively just being kept on retainer in case of war there was not anything actually stopping them from going overseas and fighting somebody else's war as long as that war didn't conflict directly with British interests i.e. they it didn't end up shooting at British ships or at British subjects and so all through the 19th century, you see various British officers popping up in very odd positions. Uh, initially, obviously, like Cochrane, leading navies and captaining ships, and in some cases even almost entirely crewing vessels. Towards the end of the 19th century, whilst half-pay officers out and about, you know, having fun in on foreign adventures was still definitely a thing, they tended to act more and more as advisors rather than integral parts of the command structure. As tensions rose towards the end of the 19th century, although the half-pay system technically continued until right up just before the end of the Second World War, uh, right before the start of the Second World War, by the time you got to, as I say, to the end of the 19th century, tensions were building up in Europe, ships were being recommissioned, officers were being recalled, so although there were still some people on half pay, most of the people who would have any kind of inclination to go off and, and do something overseas had pretty much all been recalled to the colours and would it would stay that way through the 1900s, obviously World War I, um, and then in the interwar period there wasn't that much call for you know, foreign naval officers to come and either take over command lead or in or guide a navy. And then World War Two came, obviously everyone's back again, half pay's now been abolished, and then once you get post World War Two, there is no half pay system, you're either working for the navy or you aren't. Thomas Dudkiewicz asks Whilst it's understandable why, during dreadnought modernizations of the 30s, nobody tried to put in larger caliber main guns, apart from the Italians reboring their 12 inches, why did no one try to put longer, higher velocity guns of the same caliber on? Were there even any studies regarding the possibility of rearming ships this way? Essentially, it would have been far too much hassle for not a tremendous amount of extra result, because when you consider who, who could do this. The Japanese, when they're modernizing the Congos, Fusos and Isseis, or even the Nagatos, uh, the British with uh, war spite, renowned Valiant and Queen Elizabeth, and well, apart from that, 
since we've already mentioned what the Italians did, you've got the Americans with the wartime refits of the Colorados and the st other standards. Now, if you think about all of that, the Japanese and the British don't have modern guns of a similar caliber. You know, they, the Japanese don't have a modern 14 or a modern 16 inch gun to drop in. The British don't have a modern 15 inch, although they obviously they almost designed one for the King George V. Um, the Americans don't have a modern 14 inch gun. They do have a new 16 inch gun, which theoretically you might look at putting into the Colorados for either the 16 inch 45 as found on the North Carolinas and South Dakotas or the 16 inch 50 as found on the Iowas in theory. But when you look at it in practice, the advantage would be relatively minimal. The ho ammunition hoist system of the Colorados couldn't handle the Mark 8 Super Heavy shell, which is what the, 60, the new 16-inch 45 and the 50 used, and they had to, they'd had to design a bigger turret for the 16-inch 50, so you'd probably... I mean, you might be able to squeeze twin 16-inch 50s onto the Colorado's barbette ring with some really interesting engineering, but I doubt it, and if you did, you'd probably end up with something with a very, very closely spaced set of guns, which probably isn't going to work out very well. On top of the costs of, you know, ripping out the entire shell hoist system and replacing it. So it's just, it's far too much work for a 21 knot ship that is basically going to be doing shore bombardment for the rest of its life. Um, if perhaps the Colorado class were capable of 25, 28 knots, let's say if the Colorados had been designed as kind of an American Queen Elizabeth type, they might have looked into maybe putting in a slightly more powerful gun, but even then, probably not. Um, and even if they had looked into it, it would have been just because they had them around. Um, whereas for the other modernizations, it would have required developing a brand new high ve higher velocity more powerful gun in that particular caliber purely for the purpose of slightly upgrading the firepower of older ships which would have been a lot of money invested a lot of time invested plus again potentially having to rework the ammunition hoists maybe and having to definitely rework all the turrets in terms of their turret balances and everything because obviously longer guns point of balance is different recoil is different etc etc which would have been, as I say, a lot of time and expense for modernizations that everyone was expecting would provide a credible deterrent, but probably wouldn't need to be called into action because everyone was thinking that war would break out three or four years after, after it actually historically did, at, by which point most of these modernized ships would either be back into second line roles or perhaps even decommissioned in favor of brand new ships with other calibers of guns obviously 18.1 and 20 inch in the japanese case uh, the 14 and the 16 inch in the british case and the 1645 and 1650 in the americans case now with that said as i've mentioned in other videos i think if they had gone with the new 15 inch 45 caliber gun on the king george the fifths they given the design spec for that gun there's a somewhat plausible argument to say that there might have been some benefit to refitting the modernized 15-inch ships with the same gun. But that's even then, that's because the gun would exist, and you might as well, considering you're doing some fairly major modernizations to them, and you probably wouldn't have to change the ammunition hoist system in that particular case, but it would still be a fairly marginal decision, I think. Sinar asks... You've talked about the loss of expertise in shipbuilding by the Germans, and that makes sense in the interwar period. I've heard people say that we could not build battleship armor or guns today for similar reasons. Is this true, and would we have to learn how to do it all over again? And if so, could we learn it faster with examples like USS New Jersey just sitting there? I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say they're a lost technology, but yes, I mean, to a degree, if somebody turned around today and said, right, we're going to build a new battleship, I want it to be armed with, you know, 16 inch guns and 15 inches of belt armor. Yeah, we couldn't, as various modern first world nations, turn around and just deliver that. Say, yes, okay, we can do that. 
we do not have the technology to do so. Or rather, we have the technological capability to do so, but we haven't actually implemented it. So what I mean by that is you need very specialist tooling, factory production lines, and in the case of battleship, well, battleship, both battleship armor and battleship guns, machinery, um, heating and cooling techniques, steam, as well, presses and hammers, all this kind of stuff, to actually make the, the material. You know, producing steel of the appropriate grade and with the appropriate trace elements, etc., to make battleship guns and to make battleship armor that we can do you know we know the chemical formula this has all survived but then turning a block of homogeneous steel first into a plate of a given amount of thickness and then cooling it differentially to produce corrupt style face hardened steel there hasn't been a call for that for well over half a century as a result of which all the machinery and the knowledge of how to do it in detail has all been dismantled and gone. So if we wanted to do it, we've got the reference materials that would tell us how. We've got the ability to produce the baseline materials, but we'd have to rebuild the factories. We'd have to get a bunch of workers in. We'd have to train them in the stages in how to do this because obviously there's no one around these days who could just say oh yeah well back in the day this is exactly how we did it and to be honest these days with all computer-aided controls and health and safety they'd want to do it a completely different way anyway so you'd ha we'd have to redevelop the technique based on what we know from how it was done before then there'd be a few test runs and then yeah we'd be able to manufacture it again but it would take huge amounts of money huge amounts of time you'd be talking at least, even even in an absolute rush emergency situation, at least half a decade, and more realistically, at probably a decade plus, before we'd be in a position to churn out the first fully working, brand new 16-inch artillery piece or 15-inch slab of face-hardened steel armour. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's almost like uh, World War II warbird production. You know, if someone says, oh, I want to build a P-51 Mustang or I want to build a Spitfire... You can't just build one. There's no factory with all the tools and the jigs and the production expertise and the materials on hand that will just put together a Spitfire or a Mustang or a Bearcat for you. You can do it. You can hand do it effectively, obviously with help of machinery, but I a custom build. Um, and someone could put a factory together to churn out Spitfires or Mustangs, etc. I mean, they used an adapted Mustang airframe for some kind of close air support aircraft proposal at one point in the recent past. But it would be a case of having to build back that capability first before you could actually produce the thing that you want. And finally for this week, Joao, or Zhao possibly, Rita asks, the glorious 1st of June, considering that the Royal Navy, whilst destroying a large number of French warships, failed to intercept the absolutely vital grain convoy, the destruction of which could have put an end to the French Revolution, can we say that the battle was a strategic victory for France? So, I mean, obviously the battle is, a, as you say, a tactical victory for the Royal Navy. They're left in control of the battlefield, and they have half a dozen prizes to their name. Strategically, obviously, their objective initially, well, their main objective was to intercept this important supply convoy, and as you say, they didn't manage to do that, and thus, in the short term, given the overall objective of the two sides, the French to get the convoy in and the British to stop the convoy, you could consider it to be a strategic French victory in the short term sense, but in the longer term sense, I do I'd hesitate to call it an outright French strategic victory. I'd say it's a, it's a short-term French strategic victory, but a long-term French strategic defeat, because it's not just about the convoy, although that's the primary short-term issue. It's also about the fact that once the French fleet is, or what's left of it, is forced to retire to um, French ports and refit and repair and renew itself... The British fleet under Howe also has to do this, but they have other ships available, and because they haven't lost any ships, they've just got damaged ships, 
the British fleet is able to show up again unchallenged off of the French coast and conduct a system of blockade for the remaining portion of that part of the war. So, you know, ending up as a reasonably direct result of the battle, having your coast blockaded and unable to do a tremendous amount about that for quite a while, I would argue is also is a strategic defeat, even if it wasn't the initial strategic issue at hand in that particular fight. So, yeah, a little bit of both on the strategic side of things, I think, for the outcome of the glorious 1st of June. And that's all we have time for this week, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Just one small piece of channel admin. How would people feel about pin badges? Um, I'm not talking about, you know, the the cheap and cheerful, you know, tin plate round type things that are, you know, probably, I don't know, 20 cents or something to make. I'm talking about some proper enamel metal outline pin badges um, commemorating various navies in my usual semi-sarcastic manner let me know would you be interested in seeing some ideas and concepts for them Uh, if so i can move forward with the project Um, comments in obviously the comment section below shockingly enough anyhow thank you very much and see you in another video